were learning last week, um, well, I was learning at least, um, that you were saying that, you know, some, the vintages, some vintages drink better than others because of climate conditions, because of the yield of the vines in a particular year, because of the, because of the rains, etc. Will the, will the droughts that we've just experienced um, in the last two years impact on the vintages um, that are coming out now? Um, uh, and, and, you know, is, will, will that have a positive or a ne negative impact on these vintages that are, that are being produced and, and released into the market now? Roland, do you want to comment something? Well, I'll start off. The, I mean, it's, Matthew, that's a, quite a heavy loaded question yeah. that could really take, uh, if one gives it the proper attention, it could really take a wine talk on its own feet. Um, in short, the, the drought has been affecting the Cape for a long time, but notably so since 2016, but, uh, perhaps even from 15, but notably 16 and 17. And 2017 has been one of the best vintages of the modern era in the Cape. So it doesn't affect quality uh, negatively as much as it affects yield, i.e. volume negatively. Um, so we've actually had some, some very good results, um, especially maybe not so necessarily from Bordeaux varieties, but especially from older vines uh, that are more heat and drought resistant. Um, so I think for Bordeaux, it's not, a great, it's not a great result if it's too warm and too dry for Bordeaux uh, varieties in the Cape. Uh, but for others it is. And, and we've, as an industry, have started adjusting where in the really hot, dry areas, uh, folks are moving away from planting the noble, what's known as the noble varieties, that's sort of mostly Bordeaux and a couple of others, and looking for stuff that's more suitable to the natural terroir. Mm. Mm, fantastic. Well, yeah, I think it's, it's a lot more complex, as Higo said. Uh, it, it does influence the makeup, the composition of the wine, the pH and various other factors and acidities. Uh, but the winemakers and farmers of today are able to mitigate a lot of that drought influence uh, by the way that they farm, by the way that they make wine, um, you know, measuring yield uh, and so on throughout the year. So that's important. What one must also realize that if you look at Bordeaux, the great vintages are always the hot, dry vintages. 82, 2005, 2009, 2010. It's dry and it's hot through summer. It doesn't necessarily have to be baking because Bordeaux can get quite hot but it's dry and uh, you need those um, dry months uh, through the ripening season. Otherwise you have opportunity for rot uh, and fungal development as well um, as dilution. So really important to have dry uh, summers and we certainly have had that. Um, and you would think that <clears throat> the hotter it gets and the drier it gets, the, the smaller the berries are. And Cabernet for instance is a very small uh, berry already. So it produces extremely rich and tannic and long aging wines and maybe that's where 2017 is, has done very well um, if they're able to handle those tannins very well then you have a very fine 2017. Mm, fantastic right now gentlemen without that uh, without further ado i think um that's that's enough from me and i'm going to i'm going to flick over so i'm going to turn off my video and flick over to our producers page and i think we can do a bit of a a, a recap of um of uh, where we were where we were last week and um and we can carry on um we can carry on with uh, looking at some of the producers. So let's, uh, I think. Sure. With uh, Matthew, should we just do a short recap on Bordeaux like we did last week? It was a bit longer last week, but maybe just a few minutes about Bordeaux as a region and Higo can then maybe comment on South Africa uh, in Bordeaux. Just um, for those that weren't here last week, uh, Bordeaux is the biggest, finest wine region in the world and it has been making fine wine for uh, as long as any, um, a fine terroir region in Europe. Uh, the Romans started making wine in Bordeaux 2000 years ago and through um, various relationships and uh, and so on, um, Bordeaux became the, the wine to trade and to purchase in Europe and in across America throughout the 15, 16, 1700s and uh, it really has been the leading fine wine region of the world um, and uh, the the, the grapes of Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot and Cabernet Franc have been well suited to the region of Bordeaux, the way that it uh, um, has uh, certain climatic influences and the left bank is more gravelly 
which is better for Cabernet. The right bank is more, more clay and that's better for Merlot. And you have a, a region which has really been designed around these grape varieties over thousands of years. Uh, whereas the, the situation here in South Africa is quite different. We've applied the Bordeaux uh, winemaking and varieties to our regions uh, here in, in South Africa. And Higo, have we got it right? It's certainly in some areas. I think nobody would argue that uh, that most of the Boerland, uh, particularly Stellenbosch and parts of Paul, etc., has um, maybe areas in Franschhoek has made uh new world uh contesting with the best in the world uh cabernets and bordeaux reds um but as we noted last time it's it's probably a debate or a discussion that one can have uh on its own to talk about whether all of the bordeaux influence on the cape has been has been positive and i think you know we are adjusting in the regions where it doesn't work that well uh, because I think the first thing that should be said is it has been fashionable. So we've we've planted it, uh, driven by a market, so driven by demand, rather than maybe looking at creatively or artistically or naturally what can be the best. But I think even if one did a complete clean slate and a revamp of the Cape, a lot of uh, producers, especially in Stellenbosch, would do exactly the same again if they had the chance. And we have many of them on the on the auction line up here for the Bordeaux sales. Just a couple of interesting comments I want to make. I won't uh, go in depth uh, as we did last time, but with regards to the South African context on Bordeaux, if you put Bordeaux in um, in perspective, Roland's noted how important it is in the in the global scene. It's probably uh, it's being much uh, challenged now, but it remains the leader in terms of price points and in terms of important red category. Um, but they, they do this with quality and with volume. So the, the volume is, is really a key thing that they're able to penetrate the market with. Um, just to put it in perspective, Bordeaux's total output in terms of production is plus minus vintage dependent, the same as all of South Africa, everything in South Africa. So um, that gives you an idea of how much wine they make just in the region of Bordeaux. Um, the impact that it's had on South Africa has really been a recent impact. In, uh, Notably from sort of the 1970s, when players like Mirlist, uh, Rustenberg, um, Kanonkoff, and, and these players started, yeah, started doing Bordeaux blends, uh, doing straight varietal Cabernet. I mean, it was before that there were a few significant ones, Alto, Zonnebloom, Lanzarote, etc. But they were, it wasn't as regulated. The wine of origin scheme regulation only came in 1973. The estate concept only started taking off in the 70s. So that's really when we started gaining some traction with our Bordeaux blends. And then notably in the 90s, when we had a lot of inter international in investment and a lot of academic uh, focus on our vineyards, we started making stuff that's, that, that was challenging the world. Um, yeah, I think maybe as we go along, I'll, I'll touch on some historical little uh, interesting facts. But for those that tuned in last time, I think we shouldn't dwell on the on the intro too long. What do you think, Matthew? Fantastic. I yeah. think, um, yeah, let's go and let's start looking into the producers and uh, and then you guys can sort of point me in the direction and, uh, and and we'll go from there. Okay, I think we need to probably take uh, take off from Glen Ely because we uh, we stopped around Ernie Owls uh, last time and we didn't give Glen Ely the, the attention it deserves. So, um, there's a nice little uh, vertical six pack of 2008 to 2013 from uh, of the Lady May, which is their flagship red. You'll see there in the collection, the label change coming in uh, 2010. Uh, but those are all the Lady Mays. It's really sort of a Cabernet Sauvignon, um, but it's it's labeled as Lady May because there's small dollops of Petit Verdot and uh, vintage dependent Mer uh, Merlot in the blends. But they are legitimately allowed to label it as a cab because I think it's it's never really more than 15% of those varieties. But anyway, this is their branding. And the reason they call it Lady May is after their glorious uh, French owner, Madame May de Lankesang, who's also the owner of uh, Chateau Pichon in Longville. Oh, she was the owner. She sold in the meantime. That's true. Uh, Chateau Pichon in Longville, Contest de la Lam. Um, so this was really a significant investment. If you talk about the significant international investments that happened around uh, the Cape, 
around the 90s and 2000s. Uh, Glen Ely was started in 2003 from this uh, purchase of land right next to Rustenburg. Great terroir. I mean, Rustenburg, as we all know, is a wonderful terroir in the Idas Valley. Um, and this six pack is from the producer, so it's wonderful provenance. It's obviously been stored well. I think if you're a fan of classic Stellenbosch Bordeaux reds, then uh, this is something that you can't miss. Uh, it includes some wonderful vintages there. The 09 got a Platz of Five Star. Uh, 2012 and 2013, both 95 points from Tim Atkin. So, yeah, it's a nice little lineup. And unfortunately, it's only one bottle of each, but that's, that's how it is. If I can just comment on this, um, Lady May for me is starting to become one of the finest red wines in all of South Africa, in my view. And uh, when, um, when a purchase like this takes place, uh, one needs to expect that there's going to be a 10 or 20 year investment in a property before they start getting it to the level perhaps that um, they were reaching for. And uh, this has been a, a long term project and maybe they've not quite been as fast as we were expecting to get to the top. But I had a bottle of 2013 um, a, a couple of weeks ago. And let me tell you, it was absolutely astonishing. The fine tannins, the finesse, the detail on the wine was as good as a first growth Bordeaux. And when you consider the price to be a 20th of the price of a first growth Bordeaux, it puts it into some perspective and tells you why these wines are just so um, well, uh, well priced in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, uh, I think watch out for, for Lady May and for Glen Ely. Um, it's a, it's literally the best terroir in, in Stellenbosch and they've got everything behind it to make one of the greatest wines in South Africa. Yeah, they've really stuck to their guns, haven't they? Uh, Luke O'Connigan, the, the winemaker there, he's not necessarily Mr. Um, Mr. Sales or Mr. Charisma, but you know, he's, he's very focused and he's been there since the start and, uh, They've really kept their style the same and just improved vintage by vintage as they're learning things. So I agree with Roland. It's uh, it's on the up. And if you look at that estimate range, uh, five to six six thousand rand for these uh, well kept older vintages, it is really you compare that with uh, let's say second or first or third growth growth uh, Bordeaux. It's you can't compare it, can you? Um, yeah, it's incredible. And uh, they've got Christoph de Haas, who's the chef or the restaurateur on their property. And when restaurants are open again, and you're in Stellenbosch, if you miss out on going to the bistro at uh, Glen Ely, uh, then you're missing out on some of the finest food in South Africa. Food. Christoph uh, is from the northern part of France, and his food is is classic French. It's big portions. It's lots of butter and cream. And it's perfect uh, for summer or winter. And uh, it's one of my favorite places in the world to go to. So I just thought I'd put that, put that out there as well. Cool. And then the other producer on the, in the first column that we sort of brushed over a little bit last week is Hartenberg. Um, and all of those uh, lots on the Mackenzie. It's a, it's a whole uh, selection of top vintages of the Mackenzie, which is their sort of flagship red Bordeaux blend from the estate, single vineyards uh, combined there, mostly Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, the Mackenzie is named after the current owners, the Mackenzie family, who is responsible for, uh, should we say, the region, uh, regeneration of the of the farm in its current form. This, this Artenberg is a legendary farm in the Bartleray Hills. It was owned before by the Finlayson family, the Gilbys family. It goes back quite a bit. I mean, they they can lay claim to some of the first labels, maybe under on the previous uh, labels, but some of the first releases of um, uh, of quite a few uh, grape varieties in, in SA. Uh, the Mackenzie has now started uh, getting some sort of vine age, vineyard age to it. The other notable thing to comment there is Carl Schultz has been there for more than 25 years. If you're talking about a winemaker getting to know his vineyards, that's... Uh, that's probably one of the, if you look it up in the dictionary for Stellenbosch, Carl Schultz must be there. Um, and yeah, we've got two little verticals that's from the producers and then uh, from, the, from the farm itself. And then there's uh, great vintages of 05 and 03 that's uh, from private collectors. And I mean, those two vintages, 2003 and 2005, are two of the best of the decade. 
Um, and they've, they keep really well. Artenberg makes their wines quite ripe. I think producers who know the Artenberg wines would know they, uh, they have a lot of volume to them, uh, quite a bit of extract and ripeness, but they, they do keep, they, uh, they age superbly because of the balance and just the quality of the fruit. And these two vintages we know have, have kept really well. Roland, do you want to add something? Oh, nothing to add there. I think you said everything that, uh, you know, Hartenberg has always been one of the classic top producers in Stellenbosch. And uh, every now and again, you have a bottle of Hartenberg and you go, yes, that's why they are where they are. Because consistently, year after year, they just make uh, fantastic wines. And uh, from the Chardonnays all the way through to the, the Syrahs and the Bordeaux blend, um, they certainly are at the top of, of Stellenbosch. So it's great to have them on the auction. This 2005, of course, was a platter five star. Uh, so it was recognized for its quality around 2009, I think. And um, yeah, it was stated then that it will keep well, and it certainly has. So uh, that'll be, that'll be a, a good one to pick up. Maybe, and one thing to say, uh, Higo and Matthew, is these wines are extremely rare. Um, I must have come across the 2003 Mackenzie maybe once or twice in the last five, six years. These wines do not, they, they don't have them from the farm. They don't have these stocks anymore. They aren't able to sell them. So a private collector, I think this one has been stored at Wine Cellar um, in, our, in our professional storage for the last 15 years. Um, this is prime stock. You're not going to find this anywhere else, maybe in the world, um, to have fine prime uh, bottles of 15-year-old uh, uh, Hartenberg wines. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then if we go back to the list, the uh, uh, the next one in the lineup is Jordan. Uh, you yeah, did we speak spoke about, about um, Obreon last month, uh, last week, didn't we? Um, I I think I mean we no, mentioned it again, but that you was didn't. the eighty nine. That's uh, hundred points from Parker and various other critics, and just uh, oh, yes. a benchmark wine. There it is. Yeah, well, I've, uh, I've mean, been lucky enough to taste it a couple of times. Um, Higo, have you tasted it? I haven't. No. What was the Obreon we had at the at the um, at the dinner last year? What was the vintage at the Strauss uh, Bordeaux dinner? That was ninety eight. Uh, also very good. Um, but this one is a a legendary uh, vintage eighty nine. It was the greatest wine of that vintage in 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 89 and uh, the likes of Neil Martin have said it's one of the, the top three, top five Bordeaux wines they've ever had. It's uh, just a, a wine that's going to last for a very long time. You'll see the estimate is quite high on this and that's really because this wine sells for more than that in, um, in the other markets and the seller is saying if you want this wine you're going to have to pay for it um, and quite rightly so. This wine is going to age for another 30, 40 years and it could be <laughs> Who knows what it's going to cost in 30 or 40 years' time. Okay, let's move on to Jordan, shall we, Higo? Yeah. Uh, so we've got the Cobbler's Steel 2001 on. That's the only lot from, from Jordan. So those who know uh, the, the wines of Jordan would know Kathy and Gary Jordan, who built up this brand from about 1993, I think, when, it, uh, when it, they started making wines from the vineyards purchased by their, their family. Um, and it's really just been one of those farms that have been able to be with, uh, throughout the, the challenges um, coming to the SA wine industry. They've been commercially successful through uh, focus and dedication and hard work. And it's, uh, so it's, it's great branding, but it's also very good quality wines. The Cobbler's Hill is their flagship red uh, Bordeaux blend. Um, usually sort of Cabernet Sauvignon driven. Uh, I think they tend to have quite a large component of Cabernet Franc into it as well. Um, and the name Cobbler's Hill honors the, the family. This is in Stellenbosch Kluf, so it does have this little bit of elevation and then with the influence from the Southeaster. Um, and they, they, they named uh, Cobbler's Hill after the, the Jordan family uh, Heritage of master shoemakers, so it's a nice little homage to the to the Jordan shoe brand. Um, yeah, and it's just really been one of our stalwart Stellenbosch producers. Uh, the 2001, I don't know if we found any super high critic ratings. There, it got 91 points from one enthusiast, which at the time was hard to come by. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've tasted it. They they did a little. Um, 
uh, vertical of Cobblers Hill at the farm along with the nine yards Chardonnay recently and I tasted this 2001 and it's it's kept superbly it's um, it retains a lot of its structure uh, stays really nice and dry lots of tannin there I think it's quite a cool site where they where they get the Cabernet from so it's um, yeah just classy and it's not going to be super expensive I don't think yeah, and again, once again, Rhea, where else in the world are you going to find a 19-year-old Cobbers Hill? I think it's just uh, utterly rare. If you're a Jordan fan, this would be the one for you. Right, what, let's move yeah. on to the next one, Canon Cop. Wow, we can talk about Canon Cop for a whole session, really. Um, I think we've got uh, a good number of Paul Sowers uh, in the lineup. And what would a border auction be without uh, Paul Sauer? Um, I mean, really, it's 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 won the IWSC uh, border trophy three times ahead of winemaker of the year. Yeah, with uh, with Arby, uh, I mean, he's been there. They they haven't had many winemakers at Canon Corp since the start. Really, there's it's just one of uh, probably is South Africa's most reputable wine producer. And you know, they 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 stick to their guns. They stick to their methods and, and winemaking and we we didn't hold back with regards to um, what's listed from from Canon Corbier. We've got a lot of Paul Sauer's on. We've got great vintages of Paul Sauer. There's 2003 on. Uh, there's 1998 Paul Sauer, which was a platter five star and trophy winner at Old Mutual. Uh, so it's a it's really a great selection. If you're if you're a fan of of Canon Corps uh, and specifically Paul Sauer, there's going to be uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a treat to to see what's on offer here. There's also um, large formats of the his magnums of the 2012. 2012, I think, is a little bit of an underrated vintage uh, for Stellenbosch. It hasn't been getting the recognition of the big vintages like 2009 and 2015. But if you like a little bit more elegance, and you know, I've tasted a lot of 2012, not only from Canonco but across the board. Uh, in the past three or four years, and it's be, it's a vintage that's keeping superbly well. There's a lot of elegance to the vintage, and especially as we said last time, the large formats uh, they age a little bit uh, better than 750 milliliter bottles because of the ratio of wine to airspace uh, under cork. Um, so this little magnum lot is probably something that I might look at bidding on myself. It's going to be a wonderful. Uh, wine to lay your hands on. It was uh, 95 points, 96 points from Tim Atkin. Um, and I think if he retastes that now after having given a subsequent vintage of over 100 points, he might probably put a little plus next to that 96. It's a, it's a top, top vintage of Paul Sauer 2012. Yeah, it's been... Yeah, Higo, maybe I can comment a bit on the pricing of Paul Sauer and Cabernet. It's really been the wine that's jumped uh, the most in the last few years, really, because of that 100 point uh, uh, from Tim Atkin in 2015. And what you're seeing is that uh, older Paul Sauer is now attracting a, a bit of a higher a premium to them because the current vintage is so much more expensive um, now in the market. And uh, we quite comfortably, either on the auction or through wine cellar, selling the 2015 and 2000 rand a bottle now, uh, when it was released at around um, 550 rand. Uh, so that's been a remarkable appreciation in the wine. Um, and yeah, great vintage. Yeah, uh, great vintages. Yeah, should cost the same and 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 more. And that's why the prices are as such. That 91 I've had it a, a number of times, and that's an underrated vintage 91. Um, and you can see it's got quite a, um, a, a high estimate, but uh, in immaculate condition, these bottles, and extremely rare, certainly um, one for investment. If you like old school, classically styled wines, um, then this, this is for you. There was a comment uh, um, from Neil Martin. He tasted some vintage uh, uh, Paul Sauer and Cabernet recently, and I think it was a 94 cab. Um, or 94 Paul Sauer that he gave 96 points and he commented that it's as good as a first growth Bordeaux of, of that age. Um, so we, sometimes, um, I think there was a bit more vintage variation back in the day, perhaps at Canon Corp than there is today. Um, the technique was much older, we, they didn't have the technology and so on. Um, so the wines are um, slightly rustic in some vintages, but when you get to a great vintage like 95, 
91, 94, they also um, peaked through. 97 was, um, was a cooler vintage and wasn't given much praise when it was young, but the 97s are now stunning um, and even better than the 98s, which was regarded as a great vintage. Uh, but there you've yeah. got 95. Higa and I drank some of that 95 recently and it's, um, it's certainly at its plateau of maturity, but it's not going anywhere. It's not going to fall over. It'll last for another decade or so. Um, 2009 was an incredible vintage for Paul Sauer, and that's certainly one um, putting on. So, as Higo said, lots to explore. Um, and just one more comment we must make on Canon Corp. I think everyone jumps at the Paul Sauer, but if you taste the Paul Sauer and the Cabernet side by side, you'll find that some people will actually like the Cabernet more. It has more austerity, it's got more tannin, it's a bit more of an austere, long aging wine, whereas Paul Sauer has a little bit more plushness, and Merlot gives it a little bit more of a rounder mouthfeel and you can drink the the Paul Sauer earlier whereas the Cabernet you really need to keep for a bit longer and you see that in their releases they release the Cabernet one year later than they do the Paul Sauer um, so that's just one um, one thing to take into account if you like a really classic really um, more Bordeaux style then go for the Cabernet if you want something a bit rounder a bit more easy going on the palate then the Paul Sauer um, is the one to choose, even though it's, it's, it's no less thrilling, it's just a different style. Yeah. Yeah, it's really one of the wines that has done a lot for putting Stellenbosch and South Africa red as a whole on the, on the global map for us now. And it's, uh, it's doing this not by, being, by doing something as a flash in the pan, it's doing it by uh, being consistent. And I mean, this is, I suppose, uh, if you look at at uh, not only wine but all sorts of brands from around the world it's about consistent quality year after year and i think if if you say those words if one of the first brands or the first brand that comes to mind in south african context must be uh kind of cool. so paul sauer is named after uh, uh previous owner paul sauer he's actually the, gra the grandfather of the current uh generation owners of uh of paul and johan Kriegen. Um, and he was a legend in his own right. He was a member of parliament um, and like legendary farmer. There's, there's a lot of stories about Paul Sauer. Um, Emil Hubert recently wrote a book about Kanonkop that's very interesting for those who are interested in the history of Kanonkop and all the stories and tales. There's a book recently published about it. Um, but it's just, yeah, a wonderfully... Um, um, What's Niederich uh, in, in, in English? Uh, humble know. farm. And they, they just really, yeah. <laughs> well, they, every, everyone, if you, if you speak to Aubrey, he's almost shy about his uh, accomplishments. But, you know, he's, he's one of the greatest winemakers in the country. Uh, and the same, as the, there's, there's very little arrogance in that farm. And they just do what they do very well year after year. So some, some great lots there too. Yeah, this one, this 98 Paul Sauer was uh, Bayer's Twitter, right? Uh, he left in 2001, 2002, I think. And this was the one, this in the 95, he won that best Bordeaux blend in the world um, for this 1998 Paul Sauer. So it was revered uh, 20 years ago and it still is revered. And again, just need to mention the rarity. These wines don't come up often and that's why you're paying a, a premium for it. Um, but that said, if you're looking at a first growth Bordeaux from a great vintage like 96, you're going to be paying four or five times the price. And um, it, it, frankly, the quality is going to be very similar. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've, we've sung the praises of uh, Crown On Corp sufficiently, but yeah, without a doubt, some wonderful lots on there. Uh, I did touch on the, the Keats uh, lot uh, last week. It's one of the personal highlights for me. There's only one lot. Uh, if you want to go into that, Matthew, lot number 35. It's the Keats first verse, uh, 2011. So um, Christopher Keats, or Chris Keats, we name, only started with this uh, uh, label under his own name in 2009. Uh, before that, he was responsible for the Cordoba, as we would all know, the Cordoba Crescendo. That's become a bit of a cult wine in South Africa. We love to sell that wine on this platform, on the on the Strauss auctions. Just couldn't find any we, this year, Higa. Just, exactly. They, it's just uh, so scarce and so rare. And this might be a bit of a personal opinion, but I think a lot of people would agree with me that the that Keats uh, just continues with that quality uh, with the first verse. 
He remains a master of Cabernet Franc, which was the driver behind the Cordoba wines. Uh, and it's also the driver behind the first verse. Um, it's wonderfully balanced, elegant, but ageable uh, Bordeaux reds. Um, the 2011 vintage, I think, let me just look here. This is, yeah, it's from the producer. So, I mean, we couldn't get any really coming out of the uh, open market from private collectors. So, uh, uh, Chris offered us this from the producer. So, it's perfect provenance. 95 points at some Atkin, and this you, you cannot find this wine, it's just super rare. Uh, this would be a, a, a great little one to look out for. Yep, shall we uh, move on? Yep, we, we can move over to Clan Constantia quite quickly. Um, certainly more famous for the white wines and the sweet wines, but um, one mustn't forget. The old Malbrook, um, I'm sure some of the listeners or viewers out there remember the Malbrook of the, back in the day. Uh, Ross Gower really became quite famous for the Vanna Constance, the Sauvignon Blanc and the Malbrook. And that was really the leading red, one of the leading red wines in South Africa. I think of recent, they've focused more on the, on the, on the sweet and the white wines. But the Estate Red remains a really good wine. And every time I taste it, I'm, I'm quite sort of taken aback as to the elegance, finesse, and character of this wine. If you like a cool climate style, I think it's quite different to the more plush uh, Stellamosh style. It does have a higher acidity and the tannins are a little bit different in composition. Um, there's a coolness that comes through on the wines, but yeah. certainly um, a really good wine. And again, not, not easy to find. Um, what do you think, Hugo? Yeah, I agree. There's a, there's a, a, a very notable difference. The other producer that we have from Constantia is the Christine uh, from Baiten Verwachting. And I mean, these wines share similarity in terms of their Constantia origin as opposed to the, the slightly warmer Stellenbosch origin. So they, they tend to be a little bit more her herbal and herbaceous. This 2014 vintage is after the, the merger with Anvilka. So there was a lot of focus going into the, into the red wines as well. So I agree with you, they, they're certainly more famous for the sweet, obviously, and for the Sauvignon Blancs. Uh, but this has a history going back to 1988 with the Malbrook. Um, so it's not to be overlooked, certainly. And it's, uh, there was a lot of focus going into the red wine quality post-2011. And if you pick um, it up for the estimate, the low estimate of 2,000 Rand with a bit of commission, you're paying about 400 Rand a bottle, which I think for a mature uh, six-year-old, uh, you know, great Constant Constantia wine, I think is a good, it's a good value as well. Um, okay, moving on. The next one is a small lot from one of my favorite wines, Le Fleur Petrus. And yes, this is, um, this is not Petrus itself. It's, it's a, a sister property. It's also owned by the Moex family who own uh, Chateau Petrus, um, the flower of Petrus. So it's a very small little uh, property, very close to Chateau Petrus on this uh, plateau uh, in Pomerol, which has been gifted with this really special clay where um, Merlot does exceptionally well. And this is a very famous wine because it makes, it's, it's made in very, very small uh, volumes and it gets very, very high uh, ratings. And therefore it's, a, it's essentially a first growth in the Pomerol um, system. There isn't a, a classification in Pomerol like there is in the Medoc, for instance, or in saint -Emilion. So with uh, Petrus has got no classification to it, for instance. And nor does uh, Le Fleur Petrus. Uh, 12 was a really good vintage in Pomerol, very elegant, fine uh, vintage. And the 12 is actually starting to drink quite nicely. So if, you, if you're if um, you looking for something a little bit hedonistic, very elegant style and very plush Pomerol, this will be great. But it's going to age for another 20 years as well. It's just, um, it's one of the, the finest wines of Bordeaux. Um, you can see they're 96 points. Uh, Neil Martin doesn't give out 96 points very easily. And um, for, for pom uh, Pomerol lovers, this is a, it's a fabulous wine, um, and it's worth every single cent um, of that estimate. How I'd wish to be drinking a bottle right now. <laughs> Listen, this, uh, this little La Riche Cabernet 2012 is drinking very nicely, I have to, I have to admit. You know, they're, they're obviously much better known for their reserve. I might as well, um, well, I'll talk about both these uh, following lots. The, 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 Lanzarote lots is, is something that I, um, I wouldn't mind to sort of get onto a soapbox for a, a moment or two, because these are unfortunately not as popular 
um, as they should and can be. I've been involved with the Niederberg auction for about six or seven years uh, before we launched the, the, the Strauss initiative last year. Um, and on the Niederberg auction, we've been, uh, because of the Lanzarak uh, ties with uh, the Stell, uh, the Stell have been bottling and storing the Lanzarak wines for a long time. Uh, there's a little storage facility in Stellenbosch at the um, Adam Tuss facility called the Tabernacle, and they have had, they've sold most of it back uh, to, the, to Lanzarak, uh, to the producer. But each and every bottle that I've opened from that facility, even though it comes in this little awkward uh, ten pin shape and half half bottle three seventy five milliliter bottles, uh, each one just uh, keeps staggeringly well. That's an actual photograph of the of the lot, so you can see there's there's slight variation in the alleage, but that's good full heights for a wine that's now effectively uh, sixty years old. And um, this 1961, when tasted by Neil Martin, uh, he, he famously said at the time, when you compare this to the legendary 1961 Bordeaux vintage, uh, South Africa should not be considered as a, as a new player uh, if we were making wines like this in the 1960s. Now, uh, we commented on it last time that we were quite in fall with the use of Cabernet Sauvignon on the lanes uh, in the decade of the 50s and the 60s. So, Arguably, this could be all sorts of other varieties in the wine and not Cabernet Sauvignon. But having said that, if you do a little bit of uh, research on this, there was bush wine Cabernet Sauvignon on the farm where the hotel is now. There was quite a bit of cab uh, and bush wine form planted. That was low yields. Um, and that resulted in these concentrated, ageable Cabernets coming out of Lanzarote. And this was literally one of the first, if, you, if you're thinking of Cape Heritage, uh, don't think we've been making cab for for centuries really to just put it into context the first red wine from south africa is uh, is chateau libertas and that started in the 1930s so by the 50s there were a handful of brands and by the early 1960s still not that much so um it's really a part of south african heritage still in this half half bottles um and yeah as i said they just keep kept incredibly well so, you know, if we, if we say that uh, Cape uh, Reds can't keep that well, all you need to do is go and look at the old Lanzaraks and the old Chateau Libertas from, from these years. And every time that I've showed them to international tasters and critics, you know, people didn't want to leave. They just got emotional about the quality that, that comes out of these uh, little bottles. So I do hope that we can give them a little bit of spotlights and, and limelight putting them onto these sales. And they're not a, you don't have to buy them as a sentimental artifact and put them in your bar to show to people. You can actually pull the cork and drink them. They are, they've held up. They obviously become a little bit fudgy and so forth. You know, don't expect a wine that's- What is fudgy, Hugo? So it's, it's an interesting thing that's, um, that we notice with the, uh, with the Cabernets, especially the Stellenbosch Cabernets um, and those that had contained a little bit of, um, of Cinso at the time, they developed this sort of sweet red fruit uh, with aging and then with further aging, it almost caramelizes to get this sort of attractive sweet fudgy character because it loses most of its aggressive acidity and tannins. So they become really smooth and soft, um, but they, they don't, they don't lose their fresh brightness. So they, it's this combination of, of a creamy character, but with, with still a lot of life in them. But yeah, they, they won't have much tannin left. They, they're quite, quite rounded now. I think they um, must for, if you, if you like older wines, if you like wines that are a bit softer and mature, then these are gonna be for you. Uh, what's really remarkable is that these were made in, in 375s and probably specifically for the railway, uh, that uh, when you're on the train, you don't want a full bottle, you, you may be traveling by yourself or with someone, um, and then a half bottle makes a lot more sense. And they wouldn't have made them to age for 60 years, that's for sure. No, no, it wasn't, it wasn't the attention, but it, they did keep. And if you, I mean, if you look at the, the aging facilities that they come from, the top of the alcohol has been very consistent. And I think the key thing is, they haven't moved around from out of there, but it's not, it's not like it's 12 degrees, perfect humidity or anything. It's just an underground cellar. 
So these wines are incredibly resilient. And the interesting thing with them is also they've sort of plateaued. So they're not getting any better and they should certainly sort of be, be drunk, but they, they're staying where they are. And, and the prediction, I know Michael Friedjohn said a few years ago when he tasted this 1961, amongst other, other wines, said the, the wines should be staying on this plateau for, for quite a while because of their um, stability that they've shown over the past 10 years. So it's, uh, it's a good time to be experiencing this sort of heritage of the Cape um, because, you know, from after that period, from after the 60s and 70s, things changed considerably from the 80s and 90s. We started following world fashions um, and we've, we've lost this. If you, the other interesting thing is if you look at the alcohol levels of these Cabernets, they're somewhere in the vicinity of about 12%. Uh, if you go post 2000 and start look post 1990, even and you start looking at alcohol levels, it's going to be much closer to 14 and a half, even 15% on alcohol. So these, uh, it was stylistically very different. And um, if you never taste them, uh, in 10, 20 years time, you probably won't be having an opportunity to be tasting these older vintages from the Cape. And it, it's a, it's something unique that nobody else in the world made wines that taste like this. It's, it was only made in these decades in the Cape. So it's a wonderful little thing to, um, yeah, to experience. Anyway, moving on, because I'm probably waxing lyrical about something that doesn't necessarily share uh, the, the passions of all. Um, the Lariche, this would be something that, um, that uh, our listeners would be aware of. I mean, uh, uh, Etienne Lariche has, has really been responsible for driving the Cabernet Sauvignon focus now with his son, uh, Christo Lariche, involved in the farm. Um, this is just one of those really like um, apps that have focused producers. 2007 is a great vintage. Um, and yeah, I'm busy sipping the 2012 uh, straight varietal, uh, let me just see, of Cabernet Sauvignon, 2012. Uh, this one is so forth, but still great quality and about half the price. But the reserve is where they do a barrel selection, a vineyard selection, all the top quality, all of the attention was in there, and the wines are structured and, and, and keeps really, really well. Um, yeah, it's just one of the best Cabernets coming out of Salenbosch. Yeah, we really what we see now, uh, Higo, is that uh, the best Cabernet producers from Stellenbosch are starting to market it themselves together. They're starting to identify that the world loves Cabernet and that Stellenbosch Cabernet is of the best in the world. And uh, La Riche is certainly right at the front there. There um, they could be a, a, a flag bearer for Stellenbosch Cabernet for sure. Um, and Etienne knows Stellenbosch, I think, better than most. And he picks the, 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 the certain parcels that he, yeah. uh, that he knows best. And if you remember, Etienne Lariche has been making Stellenbosch Cabernet maybe longer than anyone else has uh, from, the, from the 60s uh, ago um, at Rustenburg. And in the late 90s, then he started him, himself. So classic Cabernet, great vintage 07. And I think if you like Cabernet, this is one for you. This is, there's lots is from the producers. So it comes from their cellars. So it's perfect provenance as well. Uh, so it's kept, kept perfectly well can't go wrong basically if you like Cabernet, right. if you like all the vintages it's it's perfect um and then uh, are we going on to meal list or is there a little international lot i'm not sure uh, matthew, matthew can you just bounce back onto the producer list ah level baton uh, we have to taste uh, talk about level baton quickly uh, one of my favorite bordeaux wines uh, uh, it's um interestingly enough it's the longest a family owned property in all of Bordeaux is Leoville Barton. It's owned by the Barton family who have uh, Scottish links, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, if you like classically styled Bordeaux, then Leoville Barton is it. You need um, to keep this wine for a very long time for it to show its uh, full potential. This is a 2015, and, and if you're opening it before, 2035, <laughs> it's probably too early. So um, this is quite a recent release um, and it's now come onto the market. So if you do like fine Bordeaux, this is a very long-term, very fine Saint-Julien Cabernet based from a great vintage 2015, made in a very classical style. We don't have too many classically styled wines in Bordeaux um, uh, around much, to be honest. If you 
We were talking a little bit about Robert Parker last week, that he was very influential in dictating what the style of wine around the world uh, was in the, in the late 2000s. And uh, this, this is one of the few properties that never changed their style whatsoever uh, when, um, when Parker's craze took over the world. It's, um, it's a very classically styled wine. They, they, they make the wine like they made it 20 years ago. Um, and that really makes them quite different. Very humble, wonderful people, family owned, family run. Uh, just one of the properties that I love out of Bordeaux most. They, uh, partially, they, the, the family is Irish, hey Roland. Irish, I, um, I say Scottish, uh, Irish, yes. Irish, yeah. I went to the, to the farm a couple of years ago and, um, yeah, I mean, you know, Bordeaux is, is interesting and, and it's, it's, it's different to what we're, we're quite spoiled in South Africa. You know, you, you can drive through Stellenbosch and, um, and go and drive into producers, even legendary producers like Canoncorp. And if, you, if you're friendly enough and you don't misbehave, then you'll probably be able to, like Paul would pass through there or, or Johan would, might pass through or I'll, I'll be and they, um, or Aubrey, sorry, and they, they might, you know, open a legendary older vintage for you and share it with you, et cetera, et cetera. There's no chance that you could do that in uh, these famous chateaux in Bordeaux without, without an appointment. So I had an appointment and I still felt like it's a little bit hard to, to get in. I had to sort of stand at the gate for a long time and so forth. But eventually when, when I did go into the cellars and, and, and taste it, um, and it's, they are just remarkable in, in how they've, they've kept the exact same style. I used to work with Label Barton in, in England uh, with Anthony Byrne as a distributor. And the style has just uh, stayed exactly the same over the past 10 years that I've worked with them. So it's a, yeah, it's a great chateau, but it's not going to come cheap, is it? Well, it's, you know, if you're paying 2,000 Rand a bottle for Paul Sauer and 2,000 Rand a bottle for Label Barton, that's really for you, the consumer, to decide, you know, what, what is value for you? Where does your interest lie? And I think that's a really nice comparison because we've seen the 2015 Paul Sauer go for exactly that price, that estimate price on the Leo Barton. So it does put it into perspective as well. Yeah. Right, Mirlis, that's uh, that could be another talk in itself there, Higo. Um, and it's got a long history. Um, what, what I would like to talk a little bit about Rubicon is uh, very much like the Paul Sauer. It's been a very classically styled wine over the years and there have been very few that are able to speak of the track record that, uh, that Rubicon um, is. Um, but really, they've maintained that quality and probably up the quality in the last few years as well. Um, one needs to know the, the vintages quite well. Yeah, we're looking at the 2001 and that was a very good one. You can see Greg Sherwood gave it a very high point um, a score there. And um, being a larger format bottle, very rare. And you can see Greg um, says, drink it up to 20, 40 plus. I don't even think Greg will, will, will keep till 20, 40, but uh, he's saying the wine will. Um, and this is a very good vintage, 2001, very classic vintage in, in, in Stellenbosch. That's gonna go for, for a long time. Um, what, is, what are your also, uh, favorite vintages uh, there, Higo? Just, just consider that 2001 is a three liter, hey? It's a, mm. it's a Jeroboam mm. um, size. So that's, a, once again, keep really long in that sort of format. So, and it's just, a, I mean, the, there's only a few bottled every year. So it's a super rare, increasingly older vintage Rubicons are becoming very sought after and very rare, very hard to get your hands on. So we're quite proud to have a nice selection of, uh, of Rubicons. We have a handful of other, the, the Cabernet and the Merlots as well, but I, I do like, I do think we should stick our focus to the Rubicon because it's really been, it's a significantly or aptly named Rubicon in 19, 1980 when this was introduced, still made by Giorgio Dallasia at the time when this was conceptualized by, um, by neighbors and by Giorgio Dallasia. Uh, the Rubicon was a Rubicon moment in the South African wine industry and a lot of producers followed suit and started making Bordeaux style reds in the, in the Cape. And with the smaller barrels, uh, the, the French Parique uh, starting to be introduced and so forth, it was just a complete focus on quality. And, um, you know, if we look now today at uh, the stal at stalwart brands uh, coming out of South Africa, you cannot talk about the fine wine industry of South Africa without... 
mentioning Rubicon as one of your as one of your first mentions. Uh, personal favorites of, of vintages. Uh, well, look at that 95. Maybe Matthew, you can just click through onto that um, because what's important here about the 95 is firstly it's a it's 12 bottles, so that's why it's a little bit more expensive. But the other, um, and this is actually a 12 bottle case, it's not two by six. And this goes back into an era when fine wine actually came in 12 bottles. Uh, it doesn't anymore. In fact, I, I think I know one or two brands that come in 12 bottle cases these days. Bordeaux these days um, comes in threes and even ones on the, on the first growths. You, do, you don't have to order a case of six anymore. But this was a time when you could buy it in, in 12s. And this is an original and mint case of 1995 um, Rubicon. It's regarded as the greatest Rubicon vintage. I think it's better than 82, um, arguably um, maybe not um, the 2015, but this um, was highly revered around the world when it was released. And Decanter put it at the back of their uh, magazine recently as one of the, the great wines to seek out uh, from South Africa. I haven't seen a 95 Mielis Rubicon um, in, a, in about three or four years, to be very frank, um, Higo. And to see a, a, a perfect lot um, of 12 bottles in this condition, I think that's why the estimate is what it is. And frankly, this is an amazing investment. Um, I, would, uh, I would say this wine is going to last for another 20 year, years. And in 20 years time, it could be half a million rands worth. Um, who knows? It's, uh, it's really one of the great vintages of, of Rubicon. Yeah, the 94 should also not be overlooked. The 1994 is also a very good vintage coming out of the Cape. Um, I've, I've tasted that fairly recently. It's, it doesn't quite have the power of the 95, uh, but it's also held up really, really uh, beautifully. Roland, I think you've tasted it fairly recently and you gave it 91 points. There's a tasting note of yours at the bottom yeah, so there. This is very classic uh, 19, early 90s uh, South African red. It's, um, this is, comes in at about 12.5% alcohol. It's, um, it's a fine, mm. leaner um, style, uh, a little bit more rustic than you'd maybe expect, expect from Bordeaux. You'd have to like the old school style of South African wine. Um, the 95 will be richer, the 94 a little bit more elegant and soft. Um, but yeah, a, a very rare wines, uh, but it's great to see that there is stock on the market for those that are, are looking to purchase. I think um, Mielis Rubicon is the, is the greatest wine in South Africa, which is quite a bold statement. But the very fact that they make the volumes that are of the same quantity of Bordeaux Chateau and they distribute it all around the world, it's an incredible brand. Perhaps a bit underpriced on release, um, but you can see the back vintages, they do sell for a lot more. Um, and then before we move over Mielis, we must talk about that 82 Magnum uh, or double Magnum because that is just also extremely rare. They don't make those anymore. Um, it's, uh, it's been stored uh, perfectly. I've seen, I've had, the, I've had my hands on this bottle and uh, it really is just, oh, it's a, what size is that, uh, Matthew? That's a three liter. Yeah, it is, it's a, uh, yeah, three Double liter. Double Magnum, yeah. Double mm -hmm. Magnum. And um, it's just, you can see the perfect fill. It was a great vintage in, in Stellenbosch 82. And again, a hugely collectible uh, uh, fine wine that is extremely rare. Um, gentlemen, I think um, shall we? We are um, almost at time, so shall we do? Shall we do two more producers? I think the shall we do the um, Morganstern, and the uh, Mouton Rothschild, and then we can um, open up to the floor for um, sure. for questions and comments. Sure. I'll chat about Morgan's day. Uh, so uh, Julio Bertram, uh, I, I think he's quite well known to the to the Strauss uh, team, at least to the to the staff. Um, you know, because of his propensity for art collection and so forth. Unfortunately, Mr. Bertram uh, passed away a few years ago. I'm not quite sure of my facts, but it would have been last year or the year before. Uh, and the estate is now run by his daughters. Um, he he purchased the estate in the early 90s and then. Uh, started producing this estate blend. The the maiden uh, vintage of the estate blend was from the year 2000, and that's really the the vintage I'd like to focus on here in uh, talking about this wine. You know, Morganstay perhaps hasn't had the marketing drive behind them that some of our other uh, top uh, producers of Bordeaux wines from Stellenbosch have. So this is a, a, a wine of origin Stellenbosch, but as you would all know, it's actually Sunset West. 
although Somerset West doesn't have a WO designation, so that's why it's, uh, it's known as a Stellenbosch farm. I think the real reason behind that is just because it's more lucrative or more recognizable for producers, especially for export, to put Stellenbosch on your back label, whereas Carpenberg or Somerset West doesn't really have a reputation yet. But I mentioned that it's Somerset West, it's right next to Feiglichen, because it's really a different terroir to what you would have in the rest of Stellenbosch. Uh, it's much closer to, to Falls Bay, um, and it's incredible sights. I mean, uh, there's a reason why Simon van Estel went and put up his farm uh, right there. Uh, it's because it's, it's, the, it's the best terroir in, in Stellenbosch, simple as that. And um, this 2000 vintage, they, Morgenstern has become known also for driving uh, Cabernet Franc quite hard in their, in their blend. So there's always a little bit of a more uh, herbal, perhaps even slightly vegetal, but, but more earthy uh, feel to the wines. And that's really driven by the cool site, the cool climate, um, but also the Cabernet Franc components in the, in the wines. This is the first vintage. It comes from the producers. So the provenance is from the estate. Um, it's just a, a, a wine that's in, incredible. Like the, the vintages to look out for of the Morgenstern Estates is, is 2000 and the, and the 2003 and the 05. They've become stuff of legend uh, and they, they're quite hard to come by. There's later vintages that's now a little bit more available in the market, but these early vintages are super, super hard to come by. Um, yeah, and the, the other thing to mention is that Pierre Louton, the director of Cheval Blanc, has been involved on a consulting uh, basis with uh, wine. So uh, they certainly don't leave many stones unturned with regards to focus on quality and with what they do in the vineyard and in the cellar with Henry Kotzer there. So, yeah, I think yeah, all just, is that underrated. Just comment on that. Uh, top. Before you go, we, we uh, Pierre Leton uh, gave this uh, to us uh, recently or um, last year alongside a Cheval Blanc 98, which is which has got a hundred from the wine advocate, and uh, <laughs> I actually preferred this wine to the Cheval Blanc 98. It it, it was it was a better wine on the evening, and uh, I've been blown away by this 2000. Tim James wrote um, recently wow. on the 2000 being just one of the stellar wines um, that Morgan's has made and really one of the greatest South African reds of that era. I'm of firm belief that around, around the 2000 era, this was really one of the best wines that we, that we made. Okay, moving on to uh, Mouton. I think we all know Mouton very well and very collectible in art circle because of the label every year changing. Uh, they um, reportedly, they, um, every vintage, they offer the label uh, to an artist to, to, to paint um, or to design. And in return, you get, uh, I think, 10 cases of Mouton Rothschild as a gift uh, for, your, for your artwork. Um, Kentridge uh, did the 2016, um, and that one got 100 points. So that would have been a nice one to do. If you get a very poor vintage, uh, maybe your 10 cases is not, uh, not worth as much. But two nice vintages here, really good vintages, 95 and 2006. And uh, yeah, if you're a Mouton fan, I think there are very few wines outside of, you know, in Bordeaux that are better. Classic Puyak, quite powerful, rich. Um, I think there are a lot of South African producers that have modeled their wines and on the styling of, of Mouton Rothschild. Yes. Not much needs to be um, said there. It's quite an accessible style. It's quite a powerful, richly Cabernet style. Very luxurious. Um, maybe one of the first luxury wines. And it wasn't that branding just so on point, um, having that, uh, that label change every year. I think the first one that changed was 1945. Um, and uh, today you see posters all around uh, the, the wine world of all the different labels lined up and it really is extraordinary what they've what they've done marketing wise and wine wise over the last um, 70 years um, last thing we must say they 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 were classified as second growth in the 1855 classification and they obviously were very good uh, politicians or lobbyists because they were the only chateau ever to move up the classification from second growth to first growth you can imagine the kind of um, pull that they must have had to, to do that. So, uh, yeah, one of the great wines of the world. 97 points from Neil Martin. Classic um, 2006 Mouton, great wine. Do you have any more time, Matthew, or should we open up to some questions? Um, I think we we um, on the strike of five. So, um, I think let's open up to some questions in the in the in the in the meantime. I've I've just got a, a, a quite a sort of a, an ignorant question. Um, but when, when you talk about the classifications of first growth and second growth, 
what are we what are we talking about? Is that the first yield that's taken from vines, or or is it um, according to when the vines have been planted? Yeah, How we touched on this um, last week, Matthew. Really, what happened um, the last two hundred years in of Bordeaux trade over time? Uh, the the merchants were able to see which wines commanded what prices. And um, in 1855, the merchants got together and there was some cohesion in their in their thinking and in this hierarchy. And they saw that the top four wines, Latour, Lafitte, Margot and Oprion, were just so much more expensive than any other wines within the Medoc. So they said, okay, we're going to classify these first growths. Um, and, and then second growths all the way down. And that was 51 Chateau that they classified. And what's really remarkable, uh, Matthew, is that 150 years down the line, this classification still makes a lot of sense. Yes, there's some second growths that um, are very much more uh, fourth growths in quality, and there's some fifth growths like Lynch Bars or, or Ponte Cane, which operate more like first growths or second growths. Um, mm. But a lot of the wines have uh, retained their, um, uh, their classification. If you do know um, the wines well, you'll, you'll, you'll see that some of the wines are um, with investment, they can actually jump into higher categories and you can start seeing their prices incre increase quite a lot. Um, but that said, the first growths are always excellent and they, because of where they are and what they've been doing for the last two, 300 years, they never make bad wines. In fact, they only make good wines. So now, gentlemen, just um, just as sort of a, a, a sort of a closing thoughts, um, because I see we, um, we're striking five. So with them, I mean, it's, the, the the Bordeaux theme really, and as we've discussed um, in, in in previous weeks, um, well in, in previous in previous sessions, you know the themes have been really defining defining these sales because I suppose it gives people a context and perspective by which to to measure their wine. So, if you were if you were I suppose a, a, a question for the for the emergent collector, if you were if you've got um, some money in your pocket and you are looking for um to begin a seller or begin a, a collection how would you how would you focus um collecting collecting um south african wine versus these bordeaux what are the what are the kind of collecting strategies that you that you would advise people if um as i said you know if they if they're looking for looking to 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 develop a quite a quite a solid collection um how how would you go about sort of measuring the south african wines versus their the, the international variety, the international Bordeaux variety. Sure, you're asking some tough questions, some ingrained questions there, Matthew. It's a that's a tough one to to look at. But again, you need to ask yourself the question: What do you like? And if you don't know what you like, you have to taste. Uh, Higo and I, thankfully, taste a lot of wines, and um, and you need to understand what a Bordeaux gives you versus a South African a Bordeaux blend. Generally, a Bordeaux wine from Bordeaux is going to be more austere and more tough on the palate when it's younger whereas a South African wine would be a lot more accessible. Obviously, there are rules either way, but you have to understand each nature of each property. So tasting, 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 and more tasting, Matthew. Fantastic. Um, I see we've just got a, a, a question um, directed in here. Um, somebody says they've got a, a, a bottle of 1997 Trillium Cabernet Sauvignon. Can you, um, is, is, that a, is that a name that you guys are familiar with? And can you um, have any thoughts on, uh, on Trillium? I've never heard of it, which is which is not a good sign. I've seen a few bottles floating around, and we actually tasted one uh, recently. I don't know too much about it. We couldn't actually find uh, much about it, but it's not a it's not a terrific wine. We did try a bottle, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't holding up. So, um, you know, a lot of people have short memories. Um, often when they in '97, that wasn't too long ago, but actually it was almost 23, 24 years ago now. Um, and um, and that South African wines or most wines around the world aren't meant to age for 25 years. It's really only the special ones. So, you know, um, we, we know mostly which ones are the special ones by now, hey, Higo, and, um, and mm. they becoming priced as such and the market dictates their price. Um, so, you know, Higo and uh, myself and Sarah uh, and Wine Cellar team, you know, we sift through a lot of bottles before they ever make on, onto the Strauss auction. And we do a lot of tasting and um, the market reflects on uh, the quality and the prices and the, you know the quality in the bottle so sorry jacqueline um i think that's why um, open up and I, check out i've just been because i feel a bit bad not not knowing anything about it so i've just been looking it up a little bit while talking it seems that it comes from martin maynard and uh, and ken forrester 
and they did it to sort of the 1997 was produced to celebrate the uh, the turn of the century or the millennium um, and it was sort of made to be a cabinet of the century so you know one certainly doesn't want to insult the likes of Ken Forrester I think uh, you want to start off with a compliment he's been uh, very much responsible among some others but very energetically behind the revolution of, of Shen and Blanc in South Africa and uh, we sell the, the FMC the, the, the Shen and Blanc on, on different uh, uh, Strauss auctions, um, but I wouldn't say that that wine is sort of a once-off wine like that. That's a celebration of some sort. Doesn't really gain. It might be very good, but it doesn't really uh, gain value over time, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. Um, just out, just out of interest, and just another sort of a question of um, sort of picking up um, points that you guys have uh, brought up. I see, somebody's uh, annotating on my screen here. Um, uh, is there? What is the, what is the standard shelf life if we talk of it um, of South African wines? Is there is there a is there a is there sort of a, a rule of thumb that um, that uh, that that people that are tasting should look for apart from the the vintages that you guys have been um, pointing out to us? Matthew, the short answer to that, and just to add to your previous question uh, of what you asked, what what produce, what buyers should look out for, it's. Uh, it, it really is a, is a complex thing, um, but the, the short answer is no. There is no uh, rule of thumb uh, to apply to eligibility of South African wines. It's so complex that it differs not only from producer, and it differs not only from producer's wines, it also differs per vintage. So um, if, you, if you're trying to look at, and then uh, actually most crucially, it differs uh, for your own palate. So some people would enjoy a wine when it's showing primary characters, meaning the characters that came from the fruit. And some people would prefer more tertiary characters, meaning the characters that the wine develops from aging in the bottle. And that's a personal taste thing. So the best thing to do really is, as Roland said, to experiment. But if you're buying for investment purposes only, which is not really something we, we encourage, we want people to, to buy and, uh, and, and open the bottles and drink the wine and maybe you can buy um, two lots and then sell one or whatever it might be, but play around with them a bit. But if you're buying and if you're focusing on investment, then look at reputation. And I think I won't be the first person saying that and it won't be only apply to wine. Uh, you know, look at the reputation of the wine for having had age worthy uh, vintages before. Um, and yeah, that's across the board. It's not only South Africa, it's, it's really international. So look if the producer produces wine that, that can age, and then look if the vintage has a re uh, reputation for, for uh, making ageable wines. If I, if I can just uh, add there, no Matthew, you know, conditions play a very large role in this. Uh, wine Cellar, um, one of the partners in this, uh, in this joint venture, is, is almost 20 years old. And the first wines that went into that cellar um, in observatory 19 years ago um, are in immaculate condition. We've, uh, we've tasted a few of the long-term cellaring customers and taken out a few Delimas and a few other wines and uh, the quality has just been exceptional. So one uh, mustn't forget that the colder your cellar, the slower the wine is going to mature. And if you have a very cool, constant cellar, you can take your average um, uh, aging time and you can almost double it uh, because the wine cellars uh, ages so, so slowly. Um, Matthew, a general rule for me is any great wine, if it doesn't get to its sort of peak um, eight to 12 years, um, it's probably not going to. But that said, of course, there are exceptions to the rule as well. I think that eight to 12 years is a good rule of thumb for, for any great wine um, for me, um, starting to get to that plateau eight to 12 years. But you know, again, I think Hego has touched on it a number of times. We just get blown away by South African wines um, time and time again, how uh, we open them expecting not, not too much from a very, very old vintage. And we have an, an incredible experience. Um, you know, sure. I think we're gonna um, we're gonna just have to do another talk, uh, Roland, one day on on just on cellaring and aging. I think it's uh, you know your 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 experience and knowledge is just uh, is astounding, and we could listen to you all day. It's really fascinating. I think we're gonna have to come back and and program some of these uh, topics. I think there's been a, a, a lot of interest in it. Um, just uh, one one final question that we've got um, uh, uh, logged here. 
says, um, has South Africa, um, and a, a, a big, I'll, I'll go through this one, Matthew. It's quite a, it's quite a long, complex um, a question. And I don't know if uh, we have time to talk about uh, Brett um, on this uh, platform, maybe another, another show. But yes, I think as an emerging wine industry, we've all had our issues and we've had some cork supply problems. We still do, in fact, have some cork supply problems. And yes, we've had some problems with Brettanomyces. And there are sellers that out there that have um, those uh, issues and one needs to know about them. Um, but it, you know, it must be said, when you are opening a, 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 an old wine, there is an element of risk. That is uh, without doubt. And if you've got a 95 millis Rubicon and you, you're expecting them to swap it out for a new bottle if you have a cork bottle unfortunately the risk is on the consumer that's yeah. just how it is um and the same applies to any great wine around the world unfortunately we're working with a product um it's not a living product but it's an agricultural product just like you you could buy some food that might be um off unfortunately wine does have a defect um rate unfortunately and that is just um a part of the buying if i if I could just add something uh, there, just two comments I want to make with regards to, one with regards to storage, Matthew, you said, uh, you know, there's quite a bit that we can share with regards to tips and advice for storage. The the catalog on Bordeaux, uh, the, the physical catalog and the downloadable one has a whole section on, uh, on storage where we advise the correct storage of wines um, and also where we advise folks opening older corks at home what they should expect and the best way to get them out so you certainly can't be open, opening a 40 year old bottle of wine and hoping that the cork's going to pop out uh, as easily as a one year old bottle of wine uh, something i just I, I think that's a great question that's just come in but we uh, i don't i mean we can't really talk about that now and give it the justice but I, I would say for a fact that we didn't have access to the best corks in the early decades that's a uh, that's that's uh, certainly be true um, nor did Australia but you know Australia probably got better corks before South Africa did um, but then if you if you talk about bread bread is not related to cork at all bread is a, is a fermentation or a, a, a bacterial problem that comes from fermentation it comes from the cellar so that's not a cork problem and I'd say that South Africa in general if you want to say well, how do we feel about bread we don't like it uh, and there's less of a problem with Brettanomyces in SA than there is in France, for instance. So it's not, we, we certainly don't have a big problem with it and certainly not with the more recent wines because it's a hygiene thing. Yeah. Great, Matthew, so many wines to talk about. I see we have a few producers there. Hi there, Mike, and uh, some, some other producers. Um, and we, we look forward to talking about uh, Villafonte next week. We've got some Villafonte lots on and uh, talk maybe a bit more about the modern era of Bordeaux in South Africa. Um, that's going to be quite exciting. But um, sure, what a lineup. Uh, every time I, I, I go back to this lineup of Bordeaux wines, I, you know, I need to just shout out to Higo and say, how did we do this? How did we get such a great lineup of wines together? It's been, uh, it was a lot of fun, a lot of hard work, but I'm really... Uh, excited and um, and proud of the list of wines that we put together. Uh, it is really a great lineup of, of Bordeaux style wines. What do you think, Hugo? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, we've we've seen the success now with the Rhone sale to do a nice balanced combination of uh, of international wine with local wines. And you know, I think these this was the the ambition of when we started it last year. Um, and it's something that Frank Kilborn, uh, director of Strauss & Co, feels strongly about to, to give the South African wines their recognition and the platform they deserve. Um, and this is really done most significantly so when you put the South African Bordeaux ones up against the, the best, uh, the best uh, Bordeaux. So, um, yeah, no, I'm very proud of the catalogue as well. And let's hope we have the same success as we've had with the recent Rhone sale. Fantastic. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I'm going to say thank you so much to all of the producers and um, uh, collectors and um, uh, interested members of the public and our clients for joining us again today. Um, uh, please note that you can catch 
um, uh, Roland and Higo again next week, same time, same place. Um, and we're going to have the same um, uh, meeting ID to speak about um, introducing Bordeaux part three. Um, and uh, again, we will be we'll be covering uh, we'll be covering the the, the final the final lot of uh, producers in the sale. And um, it's uh, sure to be sure to be a fascinating talk. I know I'm learning something new um, every week. And gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for for giving us your time today and your expertise. It's really fascinating, and uh, look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks so much, Matthew. Thanks, everyone. Thanks Thank so you, everybody, for listening. Thanks. Have a good evening and stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.